Live from Orlando, Florida, it's theCUBE, covering .conf18. Brought to you by Splunk. Welcome back to Orlando, everybody. Splunk.conf18. This is theCUBE, the leader in live tech coverage. I'm Dave Vellante with my co-host, Stu Miniman. Carnival Cruise Lines is back. We heard from them yesterday. We heard them on the main stage of .conf. Uh, CEO was up there with Doug Merritt. Sheldon White is here. He's the enterprise architect at Carnival Cruise Line. And Alex Tabaris, who's the director of threat intelligence at Carnival. Gents, welcome to theCUBE. Thank you. Doing a lot of talk on security today. They've lined us up, which is great. We love the, the conversation. So much to learn. Um, Alex, I'll start with you. Um, when you think about security and, th and threat intelligence, what are the big changes that you've seen over the last, whatever, pick a time, half a decade, decade, couple of years even? So it's, it's just the, the amount of threats that are coming in now and, and uh, how fast they're coming in, right? We, we can't seem to be keeping up with everything that's happening in the environment, everything that's happening outside, trying to get into our environment and, and cause all that damage, right? So um, that's why Splunk is awesome. Right, I get to see everything come in real time. I'm able to quickly pinpoint um, any action I need to take, send it to my, uh, my team, and have them remediate right away. So, Sheldon, yesterday we had Ship and Shore from Carnival, and it was talking about really different problems. You know, the, the folks on the ship, you got 250,000 people on the ocean at any one point in time, collecting data, trying to make a better experience, trying to keep them connected. The folks on the shore, obviously websites and things like that. Where do you fit into that mix of ship and shore? Right, so there's a, an entire value stream that we map out as enterprise architects. And so what we do there is we um, analyze all the customer touch points and then we aggregate all of that information into a pipeline that we then um, address our audiences with those critical KPIs, um, operational and infrastructure, the entire stack. You guys obviously have a very strong relationship with, with Splunk. We heard from uh, your CEO, Arnold Donald, right? Correct. Interesting name, right? I, I, I haven't messed that up yet, <laughs> uh, and, and so, uh, where did that relationship start? Did it start in SecOps? Did it start in I, IT operations management? So it, it really started in, in DevOps, right? And they, they started, um, they, they purchased Splunk, I think back in like 2007, 2008, and they started looking at it, right, and I think uh, I was talking to one of our other architects and it was a uh, one gig is what we started at, right? Now we're upwards of six, 600 gigs just for security. So uh, it started there and it just kind of morphed into this, this huge relationship where you know, we're, we're partnering and, and touching all aspects of our business with Splunk you know, and the cloud and everything else. So we heard, I don't know if you guys saw the keynote today, but we saw some announcements building on yesterday's Splunk Next announcement we heard some business workflow and right, correct. some correct. industrial IOT. I, I would think both of those are relevant for you guys, not industrial IOT, but your IOT. Um, do you see Splunk permeating further into the organization? I guess the answer is yes, you've kind of already said that, but I'm, I'm interested in what role you guys play in facilitating that. Are you kind of champions, evangelists, experts, consultants, how does that work, how do you see that shaking So, um, we see ourselves as internal consultants. Um, we have our internal customers that uh, depend on our guidance and our end-to-end -end view of the business processes. Um, so, and now as we enter our cloud journey, um, into the second year of our cloud journey, um, just we're able to accelerate that time to value for our internal customers to gain even greater insights into what's happening ship and shore. I wonder how, if, if you could talk about how enterprise architecture has changed over the last you know, decade even. You know, it used to be you were trying to harden a two-tier or a three-tier architecture and harden top, don't touch it, it works. And then of course we all know it created a lot of different stovepipes and a lot of data was locked into those stovepipes. Um, that's changed obviously, cloud, now the edge. Uh, maybe because you guys were always sort of a distributed data company, you approached it differently, but I wonder if you could no, that's an interesting insight. question because um, the evolution is not so much enterprise architect as it is ecosystem architect, right? So now you have these um, massive, massively distributed systems. Um, so you're really managing an ecosystem of internal and third party um, and then all the relevant touch points, right? Like um, Alex mentioned, uh, all that perimeter is constantly shifting now. So um, 
Yeah, that's uh, our focus is, is always aligning with the end-to-end -end business process and our internal customers. Yeah, I wonder if we could dig into the cloud a little. Alex, if we start with you, how, how does cloud fit into your world of security? So, for me, the cloud, uh, as far as Splunk goes, it, it allows me to expand and contract as needed, right? So, um, before we used to have our, our on-premise hardware, um, very finite, RAM, memory, I mean, um, disk space, everything. So, so now with the cloud, I'm able to expand my environment as I move across all my North American brands, European brands, to be able to gather all that data, look at it, and, and take action on it, right? Yeah. And, and Sheldon, uh, you, you're using AWS. We, you know, we see there are, you know, every software provider really lives in AWS. It's often in the marketplace. Uh, we, we've been seeing a lot this week that there's you know, a deeper partnership, there's actually a lot of integration. Maybe give us your viewpoint of what you've seen of how Splunk and AWS work together to meet your requirements. Yeah, so that's an interesting evolution as well of that partnership, right? Um, so you're starting to see things like the uh, S3 API integration so that um, you're removing um, storage as a, uh, from the critical path um, and now that opens up uh, a, a different scale of uh, possibilities, right? And internal opportunities. Um, but yes, as, as you can see, leveraging the uh, machine learning toolkit, I saw that one coming. It's going to be interesting to see how, how that keeps evolving, right? And also, like I was speaking to Alex about the natural language capability. Yeah. So that, um, that also, as well, broadens the dimension of how our senior leadership will interact with these operational platforms. Yeah, I, I, I got to think you're, you're going to have your, your customers' natural language has to get into you know some of their rooms. Oh, it's going to be Absolutely. part of that value chain uh, yeah. for sure. How, how does the S3 a, API integration affect you guys? Obviously, you got to you got to get put uh, syntax in an object store, right. which is going to scale. What, what does what does that mean for you guys? So, um, using the Splunk Developer Cloud, um, we can. Uh, develop all sorts of solutions to manage intelligently how our storage, right, um, in near real time, right? So we can completely automate and um, that end-to-end -end just integration with Splunk, how it ingests, how long that data stays relevant, and how we offload it into right. uh, like things like Glacier. And, and, and the, S, the enablement uh, there is the S3 API, so you're taking advantage of all the AWS automation Correct. tooling, right. is that right? Correct. All right, so that's another example of that tight integration, um, not only with the S3 API, Lex for the natural language, and obviously um, TensorFlow and the machine learning toolkit. So I think you're going to see it's that type of, um, those type of capabilities expanding um, as uh, Splunk evolves. Next year I'm sure they're going to have a ton of more um, um, you know, announcements around how the, this evolution continues, right? So you know, I was interested in the TensorFlow and Spark integration, and Stu and I were, were talking in an earlier segment. It's, it's great, developers love that. Um, they, we saw a lot of demos today that was like, looks so simple that anybody could do it. E even I might be able to do it. <laughs> but as, as practitioners of Splunk, is it really going to be that easy? Are, you gonna, are business users actually going to be able to pick this stuff up, and, and what, what are they going to have to do in order to take advantage of Splunk, of some training involved? Or, uh, right, what's right. the learning curve going to no, be No, that's like? a great question because there's, there's uh, a dual focus to this, right? First is uh, offloading from the developer um, all that heavy lifting of um, creating this user interface and, um, and the dashboards per se, now it's all API driven. So as you saw maybe in the keynote this morning that um, they and within the demo, it was an API driven dashboard came together in, in several minutes. Yeah. But one is offloading that and um, the second part is um, just enabling the, the business user um, with uh, other capabilities like natural language processing. They don't necessarily need to be on that screen. They can get exception reporting through emails and voice commands. So training is also part of it obviously, but um, so it's a multifaceted approach to leveraging these new capabilities. Are you guys responsible for the physical infrastructure of your ships? I mean, is that part of your purview? Okay, so really it is. There's an industrial I I IOT That's component correct. big time for you guys. And, and so. there's, there's a huge push now for, for maritime security, right? We saw what happened with Maersk and the Napatea virus, right? So how it took them out of operation for, for about right. three weeks. So um, this IOT is very, 
I think, awesome, right? I was speaking to, to some of the Splunk guys yesterday about it, how, how we can leverage that on our ships to gather that data, right, from our SCADA systems and from our bridge and engine control systems to be able to, to view any, any kind of threat, any kind of vulnerability that we might be seeing in the environment, how we can control that, and, and how we can predict anything from happening, right? So, that's going to be very, very key to us. So Splunk is going to take that data right off the machines, which Stu and I were talking about. That, to us, is a huge advantage. So many IT companies are coming in and say, hey, we're going to put a box at the edge. Yeah. Oh, that's nice, but what about the data? So Splunk's starting with the data, but it's the standards of that data, they're really driven by engineers and operations technology folks. Is Splunk sort of standard agnostic? Can they be able to ingest that data? What has to be done for you guys to take advantage of that? So we'll have, to, we'll have to ingest that data and we'll have to you know, look at it and see what we're seeing, right? We, we, this is all brand new to us as well, right? right? Um, this whole maritime thing is, is, has risen up in the past year, year and a half, so um, we're going to have to look at the data and then kind of figure out what we want to see, normalize it, and you know, we'll, we'll probably get some PS services or something to assist us, some, some experts, and then we just go from there, right? We build our dashboards and, and our reports. And predictive maintenance is a huge use case Absolutely, for you guys. Yes. I mean, it's as, uh, to me, it's as important as airlines. I mean, Absolutely, as, yes. And, right. and, and so that, I would think any time you, well, first of all, real time during a, a journey, but any time that, that journey is completed, you must bring in the inspectors, yeah. and, and it's probably, I'm sure, very time consuming and precise. So, so I know that, that some of our senior leadership, especially in the maritime space, has, has now um, looking towards Splunk to do some of that predictive maintenance to make sure that we have the right nuts and bolts, right, per se, on the ship to be able to fix any issue that might arise at sea while we're, while we're on there. And I would suspect that the, the drive is going to be for human augmentation and, if, and, if, and if drive efficiency. Correct. You're not just going to trust the machines right no, out of the no. box, no way, right? No. I mean. But it's, it's empowering those engineers, right? As we see with some of the dashboards that they're coming up with at, at the keynote, uh, empowering some of those engineers that, that are in the engine room, that are in the bridge, to be able to see those issues come up, right, and be able to, to track. Plus, I would imagine this is the kind of thing, like an airline pilot, you're double checking, you're triple checking, right. so you might catch you know, misses earlier on in the cycle. Yeah. Um, I, I can see it having huge impacts. Yeah, Sheldon, I was just you know, thinking through the, the, the other uh, next announcement. Uh, I wonder if Splunk business flows, it sounds like something that might fit into your, your data pipeline, get insights, understand satisfaction. Uh, seems like it might be a fit. Is, is that of interest to you? Yeah, it, it sure is, um, because we definitely want to since we've evolved with like kind of fragmented different systems, we have still have mainframe, we still have you know, a whole call center environment that we need to uh, ensure that it's part of the end-to-end -end -end guest experience. So for sure we're getting into the early adopter program on, on the process flow. Yeah, uh, Car Carno, can you give us a little insight, what kind of back and forth do you have with Splunk? What sort of things are you asking that would help make your jobs easier going forward? Um, so, Going forward, I, I mean, I know they're addressing a lot of the um, ingestion and data standardization, and now with the decoupling of the storage, which is awesome, makes our lives a lot easier. Um, but uh, the the evolution of the natural language and the integration with AWS um, natively is huge for us as well as our cloud program matures, and we start um, enabling serverless architectures, for example. So, yeah, no, it's a very important part. Yeah, I, I mean, it, serverless is actually something we're, we're pretty interested. What, what are some of the early places that you're finding value there? Well, uh, many people don't know this, but Carnival is also one of the largest travel agencies in the United States. So, um, we have a whole um, air, well, it's a global air tra travel platform that we're currently uh, migrating to a serverless architecture, integrates with Sabre, and so um, we're looking at things like OpenTrace for that, and I know that uh, our folks, our friends at um, Splunk are, are enabling capabilities for that type of uh, management. And what's the business impact of, of, of serverless there? You just better utilization of resources, faster time to value, I mean you could describe Yeah, uh, near real time processing, um, scaling up and scaling down seasonally are, are key aspects of that. Um, removing the, um, the constraints of um, uh, CPU and storage. And right. Alex, that. does it change the security paradigm at all serverless? How does it change it? So it, it does. It, it, it lets me not have to worry so much about on-premise stuff, right, um, as I did before. Um, so that, that helps a lot, right? And, and being able to, to scale up and down quickly, as much data as we're ingesting, is, is very key for us. You guys are heavy into cloud, I mean, it's obvious. I, I wonder um, if you can share with us how you decide kind of 
what goes, I mean, you're not all in on cloud, right? It's no. not 100% cloud. No, we can and, never and, be all and, in on And we've, we've put forth that notion for years. We've, we call it true private cloud, that what you want to do is bring the cloud experience to your data, wherever that data lives. There's certain data that in workloads you're just not going to put into the cloud. That's correct. So you would confirm that, that's, that's the case. Like you just said yeah, it. Correct. You're never going to put well, some we, of these Well, we have floating data centers, so I mean, we'll always be in a, in a hybrid model. <laughs> yeah, um, but there is a decision framework around how we um, create those application migration pipelines and you know, the complexity and interdependencies between these platforms. Some are easier to move than others. Um, so yeah, no, we're yeah. quite aware of. And, and so my follow-up question is, are you trying to bring that cloud experience to those sort of floating data centers wherever possible? And how is the industry doing? I mean, would you, if you had to grade them in terms of their success, I mean, you certainly hear this from the big tech suppliers is, oh yes, we've got private cloud and it's just like the public cloud and we know it's not. Uh, and it doesn't have to be. Right. Uh, but, it, but if it can substantially mimic that public cloud experience, it's a win for you guys. So how is the industry doing in your view? So um, I think it's, um, it's a crawl, walk, run type of thing. Obviously, it, you have these floating cities and the bandwidth is a, uh, satellite bandwidth is a precious resource that we have to use wide, wisely, right? So, um, we definitely, um, our edge computing strategy is evolving rapidly. Um, what do we act upon at the edge? Um, what do we send to the cloud? When do we send it? Um, there are also some business drivers behind this, for example. Um, one of our early cloud um, forays was in replicating um, a guest activity on board the ship, so we know if somebody buys a margarita off the coast of Australia, you know, we know it in five seconds later, and then we can act upon that data, um, casino or whatever data it may be, um, in near real time. So a lot of data stays at the floating data center, obviously. Um, much of it comes back to the cloud. When it comes back to the cloud is a decision because of the expense of the bandwidth. What do you do? You, you you park the ship at the data center and put a big fire hose in there. <laughs> I wish it was that easy. Yeah, right, you got, <laughs> yeah. you got a bunch of disk drives no. that you just take and you know, load up. That's got to be so, a big challenge. So they're, they're business requirements, right? So we have to figure out what application is more important, right? So usually you're like our ship property management system, right? Where we have all our guest data uh, as far as their names, you, uh, birth dates, all that stuff. That, that takes priority, priority over a lot of other things, right? So we have to use, like Sheldon said, that bandwidth wisely because we don't really own a lot of the ports that we go into, so we can't just, like you say, plug in a, a cable and move on, right? We still rely heavily on our satellites. So bandwidth is our number one constraint, and we have to, you know, we, we share it with our, with our revenue uh, generating guests as well. So obviously they take priority, and, and a lot of factors go into that. And data's not shrinking, so I'll, I'll, I'll give you guys the last word, if you could just sort of summarize, in your view, some of the big challenges that you're going to try to apply Splunk towards solving in the next, you know, the mid, near to midterm? Um, well, I get, I'm, I'm more security focused, so for me it's just making sure that I can get that data as fast as possible. I know that um, I saw yesterday the keynote, the mobile app, that for me is going to be like one of the things I'm going to go like research right away, right, because I, I, for me it's getting that alert right away when something's going on so that I can mitigate quickly, move fast, and, 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 and stop those threats from, from hitting our environment. Sheldon? Yeah, so I think the challenges are, are, like you mentioned earlier, about the stovepipes and how organizations evolve. Um, now with this massive influx of data, it's just making sense of it um, from a people, um, technology, and processes standpoint um, so that we can have um, manage the chaos, so to speak, right? Um, and make sure that we have an, um, an orderly end-to-end -end view of, of all the activity on the ships. Well, thank you guys. Sue and I are like kids in the candy shop because we're getting to <laughs> talk to so many customers this week. So really appreciate your time and your, your, your insights and the inspiration for your, for your peers. So thank you well, for thank coming you very much. Thank you for having us. You're welcome. Thank All right, keep it right there, everybody. Stu and I will be back right after this short break. You're watching theCUBE live from .conf18. Be right back. <laughs>